Perhaps the Bermuda Triangle wouldn't have attracted so much attention if only ships had been its victims. Indeed, this part of the Atlantic Ocean has always been a very dangerous place for sailors. However, the whole problem with the situation lies in the fact that planes have also disappeared without a trace in this area. So what is the reason for the disappearance of aircraft, ships and people? The reasons to explain it are quite numerous. They range starting with UFO abductions and hidden passageways in space to parallel universes and ending with more mundane factors like severe weather conditions. There is another interesting fact. The Bermuda Triangle's seafloor has one of the most complex topographies in the Atlantic Ocean. A massive depression with a depth reaching 8 kilometers cuts across the triangle. This in itself does not explain the lost ships but it makes it very difficult to detect the sunken ships or planes that have fallen into the ocean. The mystery of the Bermuda Triangle may have yet another explanation. The warm sea current of the Gulf Stream runs lengthwise along the east coast of the United States, very close to the area where ships have disappeared. The Gulf Stream may be the reason why so many sunken ships have never been found. Their wreckages could have been carried away by the undertow hundreds of kilometers from the place of a supposed sinking. Then what could be the primary cause of the accidents? One of the most plausible theories asserts that the numerous ships that have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle could have become the victims of a rogue wave or, as it is also called, a killer wave, which can reach a height of 30 meters. Rogue waves are quite real and pose a considerable danger to sailors even these days. Unlike tsunamis, rogue waves are not formed as a result of natural disasters, but literally out of nowhere. These kinds of killer waves can appear even under relatively favorable weather conditions. They form because ocean waves are fundamentally unstable. A wave can begin to grow by drawing in the water of neighboring waves. It collects the energy of its neighbors, gains momentum and becomes very tall. The difficulty lies in the fact that it's not possible to predict the appearance of such waves. And those ships that did not have time to send an SOS signal may have been caught by surprise by this sort of wave. This version is the more deserving of consideration given that the natural conditions of the Bermuda Triangle are conducive to the appearance of these waves. But the killer wave explanation isn't applicable when it comes to missing planes. There is an opinion that this area is subjected to charged particles, which are formed as a result of solar storms. If so, then these particles could cause damage to the electronic equipment of aircraft and ships. On the other hand, the Bermuda Triangle is located near the equator and should not be strongly affected by such storms. After all, as is commonly known, the influence of solar storms is mostly felt in the polar regions. Also, seismic activity on the ocean floor of the triangle can cause magnetic disturbances, which in turn affect the operation of navigation equipment. Yet another reason of the odd behavior of the ocean in the region of the Bermuda Triangle that is responsible for the disappearance of ships and aircraft may be located on the seabed and be of a tectonic nature. Geological faults and decaying seaweed result in emissions of methane and hydrogen sulfide. As a general rule, these gases dissolve in the seawater, but when the atmospheric pressure drops, they can reach the surface of the ocean. Rising methane and hydrogen sulfide result in a decrease in the density of the water, and when this happens, a ship will rapidly descend to the bottom as the density of the water becomes less than the density of the ship. In and of itself, this theory does not explain the disappearance of aircraft, but here too, tectonic processes may be the first link in a chain of future developments. Frequent underwater earthquakes not only lead to methane emissions, but also result in the formation of infrasound, which in turn refracts radio waves. This in particular can explain the malfunction of electronic equipment and the disorientation of pilots. Infrasound, by the way, is generated not only by the Earth's crust during earthquakes, it can be caused by lightning strikes and strong winds, 
infrasonic aerodynamic noise during storms and hurricanes in which people on ships and planes may find themselves. Infrasound is fraught with yet another threat. It can have a destructive effect on the psyche and the overall well-being of a person. In other words, finding themselves subjective to infrasound, pilots and sailors can lose their minds and commit rash acts. This in particular can explain the ships found in the Bermuda Triangle that were abandoned by their crews. It wasn't until the second half of the 20th century that technology made it possible to conduct a search in the ocean depths. And even in that instance, it's very difficult to find a submerged ship. The search for airplanes and ships that went missing many years ago without specific coordinates is comparable to the proverbial needle in a haystack. Human error combined with natural phenomena has been documented as the most common cause of plane crashes or shipwrecks and consequently is the most convincing explanation for the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. This is supported by the fact that in recent years the number of lost ships and aircraft has dropped dramatically as transportation technology has improved significantly. Or are we wrong perhaps? After all, the seas and oceans, as well known, guard their secrets very closely. Thank you. 
Hundreds of books have been written about the history of nuclear confrontation between the superpowers and the design of the first nuclear bombs. But there are many myths about modern nuclear weapons. Therefore, I suggest you to make it clear and tell us how the most destructive weapon invented by man works. To see a thermonuclear bomb explode, all you have to do is lift your head and look at the sun in its core. As in other stars, hydrogen fusion is taking place, releasing tremendous energy. You're looking at a huge hydrogen bomb that has been exploding continuously in space for billions of years. But back on Earth, atomic weapons are one of the most amazing, mysterious, and frightening processes, the principle of which is based on a chain reaction. The nuclei of some isotopes of radioactive elements, such as plutonium, Californium and uranium are able to decay while capturing a neutron. This is followed by the emission of two or three more neutrons. The disintegration of the nucleus of one atom under ideal conditions can lead to the disintegration of two or three more, which in turn can trigger other atoms. Thus, there is an avalanche, like process of destruction of more and more nuclei, with the release of gigantic amounts of energy, breaking atomic bonds. In an explosion, enormous amounts of energy are released in a super, small amount of time. It happens at a single point. That's why the explosion of an atomic bomb is always powerful and destructive. Very soon, a fireball will be formed, the temperature in which will be on the order of tens of millions of degrees. It would seem that even soft, but moving at the speed of light radiation, should leave far behind the substance that generated it. But it is not so. In cold air, the run of quanta is centimeters, and they move not in a straight line, and changing the direction of motion at each interaction of motion at each interaction. The quanta ionize the air, spreading in it like cherry juice poured into a glass of water. This phenomenon is called radiative diffusion. The ball devours the space, and ionized air behind its front almost does not move. Radiation cannot transfer to it, a significant impulse at diffusion, but it pumps enormous energy into this air, heating it. And when the energy of radiation runs out, the balloon begins to grow due to the expansion of hot plasma, which is gutted from within by what used to be a charge. Expanding like an inflated bubble, the plasma shell thins. Unlike a bubble, of course, nothing inflates it. There is almost no substance left on the inside, but 30 microseconds after the explosion. The speed of this flight is more than 100 kilometers per second, and the hydrodynamic pressure in the substance is more than 150,000 atmospheres. When the shock wave detaches from the fireball, the characteristics of the emitting layer change and the power of radiation in the optical part of the spectrum increases sharply. The so-called first maximum further processes of illumination and change of transparency of the surrounding air compete, which leads to realization of the second maximum, less powerful but much longer. Near the explosion, everything around vaporizes farther away melts, but even farther away, where the heat flux is already insufficient for the melting of solid bodies. The ground rocks and houses flow like a liquid, under the monstrous destroying all the strength bonds of the pressure of gas, glowing to a glow unbearable for the eyes. Finally, the shock wave travels far away from the point of explosion, where there remains a loose and weakened but expanded many times, the cloud of vapors turned into a tiny and very radioactive dust of vapors of that which has been the plasma charge, and that in its terrible hour was close to them, place from which it should have been kept as far away as possible. The cloud begins to rise upward. It cools down, changing its color, puts on a white cap of condensed moisture, dust from the surface of the earth, follows it, forming a stalk of what is commonly called an atomic mushroom. The resulting infernal blast wave instantly kills all life in its path. And yet, it is possible to survive, being at a distance of three kilometers from the epicenter of the explosion. The average strength of the atomic bomb, of course, 
if you are lucky enough to find a suitable shelter. As computer modeling has shown, there would indeed be survivors in the surrounding areas after a nuclear bomb explodes in a large modern city. From the initial flashover, they would have only five, ten seconds to get to safety. The fact of the confined space is extremely important because following the fireball, the blast wave would be deadlier than the explosion itself. Finally, the shock wave travels far away from the point of explosion, where there remains a loose and weakened but expanded many times. The cloud of vapors turned into a tiny and very radioactive dust of vapors of that which has been the plasma charge, and that in its terrible hour was close to the place from which it should have been kept as far away as possible. The cloud begins to rise upward. It cools down, changing its color, puts on a white cap of condensed moisture. Dust from the surface of the earth follows it, forming a stalk of what is commonly called an atomic mushroom. The resulting infernal blast wave instantly kills all life in its path. And yet, it is possible to survive, being at a distance of three kilometers from the epicenter of the explosion. The average strength of the atomic bomb, of course, if you are lucky enough to find a suitable shelter. As computer modeling has shown, there would indeed be survivors in the surrounding areas after a nuclear bomb explodes in a large modern city. From the initial flashover, they would have only five, ten seconds to get to safety. The fact of the confined space is extremely important because following the fireball, the blast wave would be deadlier than the explosion itself. As is well known, atomic and nuclear weapons are the most destructive weapons ever created by man. The most powerful bomb in the history of mankind at the moment was created and tested in practice in the Soviet Union, and it was called the Tsar Bomba. The power of the bomb and 10 equivalent was almost 60 megatons, but later, the creators of the bomb admitted that they planned to create it with a capacity to create it with a capacity of 100 megatons. To this day, the Tsar Bomba remains the most powerful bomb in the world. The bomb was tested in October 1961 in the air over New Earth at a distance of 4,000 kilometers. At that time, none of the airplanes in the world could not cope with the delivery of the bomb to the right place so a special 295 V airplane was created for the test. At the explosion, the diameter of the fire cloud or ball was almost 10 kilometers. The impact of the blast wave could be felt by almost everyone in the world because the seismic wave managed to circle the earth three times in a row. The explosion left no stone unturned. The consequences were horrifying. The surface of the island where the explosion occurred became completely smooth, like a frozen lake. A village 400 kilometers away from the explosion was also affected. All wooden buildings were destroyed, and every stone house was left without a roof. It was this test that prompted most countries in the world to sign a treaty to stop testing nuclear weapons on land, underwater, in the atmosphere, and even in space. Also, as a result of the treaty, came clauses to limit the power of the nuclear weapons that were created. 110 countries signed the treaty. Nevertheless, in just a few decades, nuclear technology has undergone a significant development. Different types of bombs have appeared, such as bacterial, hydrogen vacuum, thermonuclear, and many others. Different types of such weapons make it possible both to solve large-scale, strategic tasks, and to work point blank on individual objects with the help of tactical nuclear weapons while possessing much greater specific destructive power than in the last century. For example, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945 weighed about four and a half tons. Today, however, nuclear weapons have become more compact with a nuclear bomb typically weighing only a few hundred kilograms, but it has the potential to kill millions of people at once. It so happens that despite the progress in reducing the arsenals of nuclear weapons since the Cold War, the world's total stockpile of nuclear warheads remains at a very high level. Today, about 13,000 nuclear warheads of all stripes is on alert. At the same time, people continue to invent more and more instruments of mass destruction.
the oceans that cover most of the Earth's surface are invisible territories teeming with life. Far beneath the waves, where no sunlight penetrates, is the Twilight Zone, a world devoid of light. We offer to dive with us today into the mysteries of our planet, revealing some of the secrets of the Twilight Zone of the deep sea world. Twilight Zone of the Ocean, or as it is called, Dysphotic Zone, is the middle layer of ocean waters, which extends to a depth of 200 meters to two kilometers, which extends to a depth of 200 meters to two kilometers. Near the upper boundary of this area, primary production through photosynthesis is no longer possible. And at depths below this zone, light from the surface practically does not penetrate, which creates an atmosphere that is not rosy. However, despite the lack of light, life is abundant in this zone, although different from that found in the higher or lower layers of the ocean. It is home to a variety of marine organisms whose life activities have a major impact on the global carbon cycle and thus on important climate processes across the planet. One of the key mechanisms in carbon transport may be the daily vertical migration of mesopelagic animals from the twilight zone to the surface and back. That is, they spend the day at depth, hiding from predators, and at night, under the cover of darkness, rise to the surface for nutrients. This behavior leads to the transfer of part of the carbon absorbed by them with food to greater depths together with the products of life. It is thought that the biomass of fish living in the mesopelagic zone may be 100 times greater than the total biomass of all fish caught annually in the world. For example, lanternfish, of which there are about 250 species, are not only the most common fish in the twilight zone of the ocean, but also the most common vertebrates on the planet. Their huge numbers were first noticed during World War. Aye, aye, when marine sonar operators saw echoes from what appeared to be the solid sea floor rising to the surface at night and sinking back down at dawn. In fact, the sound pulses reflected off the swim bladders of billions of lanternfish as they congregated in dense layers, hiding at depth. Their daily swimming, up and down, formed vital links between the surface and the deep. Of course, one of the characteristic inhabitants of the twilight zone are bioluminescent organisms. But why there? The fact is that because of the scant penetration of sunlight, many inhabitants of this world have learned to emit light through the process of bioluminescence. It is believed that up to 90s of living organisms living in this zone are able to emit their own light, like deep sea light bulbs. For example, the dragonfish, which inhabits a wide range of depths of thousands of meters, has a large head and a mouth equipped with many sharp fang-like werewolf teeth. These have a long filamentous structure known as antennae with a light forming photophoter at the tip attached to the chin. A certain species of dragonfish cannot glow for longer than 30 minutes without adrenaline. However, in the presence of adrenaline, it can emit light for hours. Incidentally, they emit a blue-green light whose wavelengths can travel the farthest in the ocean. But further interesting, in front of you is Lampoctea's cruent eventer a species of combfish whose body is colored dark red in order to blend in with its surroundings. The dark red color masks the bioluminescence of the organisms. It eats and hides it from potential predators, like all representatives of the type. They move with the help of movement of plates, consisting of cilia. There are survival defense mechanisms for the hatchet fish, too. The size of this fish does not exceed 10 centimeters. At the same time, its eyes are quite large, looking upward and also telescopic. All species of fish that are included in this family have photophores, which are located on the lower half of the body in groups of several pieces. The arrangement of photophores is such that the green light they emit is directed downward, creating what is called an anti-shadow effect. 
this makes the silhouette of the fish, which can be seen against the scattered light falling from above, more blurred. This is what makes the hatchet fish less visible to predators that may be below it. But the more frightening inhabitants in the twilight zone of the ocean is definitely squid. There are quite a few species. For example, the squid fly squid, only seven centimeters long, lives in the Pacific Ocean and the Sea of Japan. The body of the firefly squid is covered with many photophores up to 1101 individual. In the daylight, they look like quite ordinary squid, but in the dark comes a real transformation. The entire body of the squid begins to glow bright blue, blue light to turn on luciferin. Squid increase the flow of oxygen, carrying blood to the photophores. However, increasing or decreasing blood flow is a rather slow process and squid can make their photophores flash on and off many times a second. They do this at the expense of special pigment cells, chromatophores, able to command the nervous system to expand almost instantly, closing the photophores or gather in a point, again opening the luminous organ. Flickering squid live at depths of up to 600 meters and their glow is usually only seen by sea creatures. But every spring, these squid gather for a party off the coast of Japan to attract partners. They turn all their spotlights on full blast, and the coastal waters of the bay are flooded with bright blue light. In front of you, squids from the family, Architeuthidae use a rather unusual way to hunt as well as for defense against predators. Two long tentacles resembling clubs that are equipped with suction cups to grab prey. Extremely unrecommended encounters, and diplomacy won't work either. The squid Histiotuthis heteropsis, also known as the strawberry squid, or the poor squid. Yes, he has one interesting feature, different eyes. His left eye is twice as big, so you are unlikely to catch him reading a book. It's also bright yellow, while the other eye is blue. The researchers did sensitivity modeling of each eye, finding that they perform different tasks. The smaller eye can only see bioluminescent light sources belonging to fish swimming at depth. Increasing its size does not make it more sensitive to flashes of light, so the eye shrank to the smallest possible size. But the silhouettes of objects swimming above the squid in time to notice his large insidious eye which is unable to distinguish bioluminescent glow at a depth of more than 200 meters can be found another representative of cephalopod mollusks it is fully transparent or glass octopus length of about 40 km eyes optic nerves and digestive tract are the only structures visible in its glassy mantle not a good idea for human anatomy. A siphonophore is not a single living creature, but an entire colony of many thousands of living creatures that are united into one body. The aggregate of tiny organisms is called a senosarcoma, and each individual organism is referred to as a zood.
image of UFOs and aliens is not uncommon in science fiction. But what about the reality? What are the chances of people encountering this phenomenon? In this issue, we will try not to be biased and answer different questions and loud statements from those who have seen something and know something. And at the end, I will tell in my story of meeting with UFOs. And we will begin, perhaps, with the famous case, which occurred on July 4, 1947, in the state of New Mexico. Farmer William Mack Brazell went to check on a flock of sheep after a severe thunderstorm. At the same time, on the hillside, in the desert, the farmer saw strange debris of a mysterious object, by description similar to a flying saucer. Moreover, there were transparent spheres with humanoid figures inside. The man reported the discovery to the sheriff. The military also arrived at the site of the falling object. The story received great publicity, and the news was discussed even on the air of a local radio station. However, it was later reported that the find was a media sound, but most did not agree. About this case was not remembered for 30 years, until in the late 1970s, the head of the intelligence department, Jesse Marcel, did not admit in an interview that the version of the weather balloon falsification, and that the military really observed mysterious artifacts like non-creeping foil, strange symbols, and lightweight but super strong elements. It's a story that's been discussed in the press for two decades, and it all ended with the fact that in 1994, published the official conclusion of a new investigation. It said, crashed object, classified military program to monitor nuclear tests. Well, we never found out the truth. But this story has one strange coincidence. Namely, the year of the event. The fact is that in the 1950s was created V's. Nine, or Avrocar flying vehicle, that looks like a flying saucer. And it was not a classified technology. According to the documents, engineers tried to achieve vertical landing and vertical takeoff of the craft using jet engines. Also, experts believed that their device as a whole could reach speeds of up to 5,000 km, rise to a height of up to 30 km, and have a maximum range of about 1,900 km. But in reality, experts failed to raise the ship only a few meters, and its speed was no more than 56 km h. Because of the central jet engine, the flying machine worked loudly, and at the same time it exposed the pilot to high temperatures. Officially, the project was shut down. But what if it wasn't? Just imagine what the engineers could have achieved in 70 years. Meanwhile, UFOS continued to appear to both casual eyewitnesses and pilots. So in May 1957, fighter pilot Milton Torres, in the quiet English countryside, was suddenly ordered to take to the air and shoot down an unidentified flying object. The pilot pursued the object which at times appeared to be stationary, and then began to approach at a speed of about 2,000 km. According to the pilot, the UFO did not follow classical Newtonian mechanics. It made a right turn, almost on the spot. But when the pilot fixed the object and prepared to fire, it disappeared from the radar screens. For the record, radar can't see ball lightning. This strange encounter was one of the few that occurred during the Cold War. One of the most famous UFO sighting projects is the so-called Blue Book. This project attempted to organize numerous eyewitness sightings into one common archive. The realization of the project began in 1947. And by 1947, all activities were curtailed. By the time it was closed, more than 12,000 different kinds of evidence about the existence of extraterrestrial life, UFOs, and aliens had been collected most of which were just fabrications and falsifications of eyewitnesses. But there were some events that are still unexplained to this day. Things were different in the Soviet Union. Special services actively studied any reports of contacts with extraterrestrials. And among ordinary people, there were many activists who paid attention to this problem at will. In the 90s, interest in UFOs 
disappeared, and along with its disappearance stopped in research. Although archives about these phenomena, cases and developments still exist, and now in our time, and more precisely in 2022, NASA reported that it will be engaged in its own study of UFOs from a scientific point of view, or, as they are now called, unexplained anomalous phenomena or phenomena. And this is not for nothing. The fact is that talk of suspicious objects in the sky above different countries became more frequent after the U.S. shot down the fourth such object, including in Alaska, saying that they do not exclude its extraterrestrial origin. And as always, most of the material is classified. During the year about strange objects in the sky, said Uruguay, Chile, India, China, Canada, European countries, and especially countries where there are military conflicts, which also can't be a coincidence, then what are they? Classified developments of large private corporations, or actually the intervention of alien travelers, in favor of the latter was David Grush, former intelligence officer who also argued that the authorities have not only the wreckage of alien spacecraft, but also the remains of aliens. He is absolutely certain that the authorities for decades may have been hiding top secret programs to detect and study extraterrestrial life forms and their technology. According to him, there are partially intact aircraft of alien origin, which either successfully landed or crashed and crashed. Moreover, he was able to obtain and begin studying UFO fragments as part of the government's classified alien craft search program. In addition to David Grush, there were two other witnesses at the Congressional Committee hearing, also Pentagon employees, who spoke in similar terms. What's not clear is, if this is top secret information, why is it available to everyone? Meanwhile, Harry Nolan, a professor of immunology, said that aliens have visited Earth and are still here. In his opinion, the effect on Earthlings aliens produced the same effect as the Spanish galleons on the Native Americans. They just cannot realize. In addition, Footage of two recently declassified UFO sightings was shown. A video made in the Middle East in 2022 and remains unexplored. Another footage from South Asia, which was made this year and similarly awaits peer review. However, the reality may be more prosaic. After the incident with the Chinese balloon, they began to look more closely at the sky and just in case to shoot down in general all objects falling in the field of view. News of the shot down in the sky. Mysterious objects caused a wave of activity among amateur ufologists and predicts that in the near future reports of UFOs will increase even more. And it's true. The U.S. intelligence community said that as of August 2022, Intelligence agencies have received 510 reports of unidentified flying objects to illustrate between now and March 5, 2021. There were only 344 reports of such objects in a total of 17 years of sightings. A particularly memorable case from those times occurred in Belgium back in 1990. On the night of March 30th through March 30th through March 31st, that night, unknown objects were tracked on radar and were seen by a total of 13,000 IE witnesses, 2,600 of whom filed written statements detailing what they saw. Yes, it was impossible to hide it and pointless. Therefore, after the incident, the Belgian Air Force issued a detailed report on the events of that night at around 23 Zero, on March 30, the head of the center received a report that three unusual lights were seen moving towards the city. The lights were reportedly brighter than stars, changed their colors between red, green, and yellow, 
and appeared to be placed at the vertices of an equilateral triangle with a similarly luminous element at its center. After about 10 minutes, a second group of lights was found moving in the direction of the first triangle. After half an hour, it was possible to observe the phenomenon on radar. At this time, the second group of lights, through some random maneuvers, also turned into a small triangle. The center gave the order to send two F-16 warplanes in secrecy. Throughout this time, the phenomenon was still clearly visible from the ground. Witnesses described a whole formation of lights maintaining their position relative to each other while they moved slowly across the sky. Over the next hour, the two F-16s attempted to lock onto the target nine times. On three occasions, they managed to get its coordinates from the radar for a few seconds. But each time the position and speed of the target changed so rapidly that the lock was dropped. During the first radar focus, the target accelerated from 240 chem H to more than 1770 chem, while changing altitude from 2700 M to 1500 M, then to 3000, 300 M to 50 M, and then descended almost to ground level. The first descent from more than 900 M was accomplished in less than... Similar maneuvers were observed during both subsequent radar focuses. In neither case did the pilots have visual contact with the target. Moreover, despite the tremendous speed, there was no hint of the sonic boom that would inevitably occur when breaking the sound barrier. In addition, according to pilot Stack Robert, such a sudden change in acceleration and deceleration and deceleration would have been fatal to one or more of the human pilots flying the object. During this time, witnesses on the ground confirmed by numerous reports that the smaller triangle they had seen had completely disappeared from view, while the larger triangle was moving upwards very quickly as the F-16 flew past. After that, the plane's radars and those at the control center completely lost contact. It is actually hard to believe, but it was this object that I and a few other people observed in 2007, only it was in Russia, in a small town. The object was quite massive, about 30 meters, but at the same time absolutely silent, halted, and instantly could move in a matter of seconds. It looked exactly as it was described by eyewitnesses in Belgium. Honestly, it was hard to believe that this unidentified object was human. Made, most likely, you too have seen something strange in the sky. Share your story. Yes, people love interesting mysteries. Something mystical, unexplained, and UFOS are on that list. But there are nuances, and the increased interest in the unexplained has a downside. It can reinforce the erroneous idea that UFOs must be alien spaceships serving as a cover for government organizations and their manipulations, especially if we take into account the events of recent years. In favor of this recall, the unique secret and unclassified projects that existed back in the 1950s. Just imagine more than 70 years have passed and engineers could achieve amazing achievements in a completely new field that we have no idea about. The technology that makes silent vehicles of all shapes and sizes fly. And it seems that these technologies will be under secret for a long time because their introduction into our lives threatens to affect many interests, from national security to the world economy. But who knows? Maybe we are wrong, and we are being watched for a long time. We just need to understand who or what exactly. In any case, the truth is somewhere near.
Do we know for sure that we humans are the first civilization on Earth? Or was there already a developed civilization before us, or maybe even more than one? What if another industrial society had existed on Earth tens of millions of years ago, long before us, but now all traces of it have been lost? Or it is still possible to find some markers of the existence of someone in the past, whether it is our planet or, for example, Mars, Venus or even any distant exoplanet. Time mercilessly erases any traces of the presence of anything and anyone. Plate tectonics alone changes the face of the Earth beyond recognition. It seems that quite a lot of questions have already been asked in the introduction. Are there any answers to them? Let's try to figure it out today. As you already understood from the title of this video, today the Silurian hypothesis will be in the spotlight. In fact, this is an experiment that evaluates the ability of modern science to detect evidence of a previously highly developed civilization, perhaps several million years ago. Although it may seem an absurd idea, more inherent in conspiracy theorists, telepaths and lovers of all sorts of pyramid rocket conspiracies. And yet this thought experiment is the focus of one scientific article, the author of which is the astrophysicist Adam Frank. In his article, he presented a developed industrial civilization to people and wondered if it could be detected in space in other systems like ours. Or, for example, I would not like to think about this, but what traces will modern human civilization leave behind and how to find evidence of our existence in the distant future. The hypothesis is called the power of risk. All supposedly former civilizations from Archean aliens to Atlantis fall under it. Some versions of the Silurian hypothesis indicate that the early race completely died out due to some disease, war, or catastrophe. Another version indicates that the former race reached a high-tech level and for some reason left Earth in order to surf outer space in search of a new abode. The most exotic version of the Silurian hypothesis is the hypothesis of involution, according to which all animals descended from degraded representatives of times close to humans. Yes, it sounds insulting. But let's get back to real research. A lot of time and labor was devoted to searching for hints of climate change in distant terrestrial planets, the so-called hyperthermia, a kind of rapid temperature rise that could indicate the time of industrialization of civilization. This may suggest the presence of a sufficiently developed species. Such a leap is possible as a result of carbon emissions and so far may be the only proof that any race, including ours, will leave behind neither pyramids, nor skyscrapers, nor plastics or foam, nor Shakespeare's work, nor Beethoven's music will indicate our presence in the past, if we are talking about hundreds of thousands or even millions years. In the end, we are recognized only by the change in the breed, which marked the beginning of the so-called Anthropocene. These are terms used by many researchers to denote the current geological epoch, when human activity has a major impact on the climate and the environment. Although the Anthropocene has not yet been officially classified as a separate geological epoch, it is already clear that people have a significant influence on the geological record of our planet, shaping it today. We are already a geophysical force, and our presence is recorded in the isotopes of carbon, oxygen and nitrogen, in the extinctions of various sediments, emissions of heavy metals and synthetic chemicals. For example, the burning of fossil fuels by humans already has an impact on geological data, despite the fact that industrialization began only about 300 years ago. Well, with a big stretch, this can be considered at least some kind of plus. We managed to leave our mark, ladies and gentlemen. Future civilizations, having reached a certain level of development, will be able to learn about our existence by exploring ancient rocks. Ida, let's imagine that perhaps some other species on Earth briefly rose to at least our level of development millions of years ago. 
Are there any traces of them left today? For example, fossils, remains of buildings or space structures. Maybe, but it may also be that all such evidence has been erased into dust and that the only remaining traces are in very minor features of geochemistry. In addition, fossils are extremely rare and partial, so evidence can easily be overlooked, especially if a civilization existed for only a few thousand years, like ours. The truth is that modern humans have existed for a relatively short time, and life on Earth has existed for a total of three and a half billion years. That is, there was more than enough time in the history of our planet for the rise and fall of not one, but several pre-human industrial civilizations. It could be a certain race with its own technologies, vehicles, folklore and traditions in the same place and under the familiar sky. Well, about such bygone civilizations, industrial facilities built by them that existed for no more than several hundred thousand years, we have no reliable mentions and not even a single flying saucer with a mummified alien inside. We find only the most ancient structures and tools created by humans. And these finds are only a few thousand years old. In any case, in a few million years, when plate tectonics starts working, Everything on the surface, including the earth itself, will be at the bottom of the seas and oceans, one will turn into mountain peaks. If we talk about the age of our planet, then it is quite solid, and its solid surface, which makes up land masses, varies greatly in age in different places. Some of these land masses were formed billions of years ago. Others were formed from molten magma during the last hundred million years. Iceland, for example, began to form as a result of volcanic activity only 70 million years ago. Some small islands continue to form to this day. From a geological point of view, one of the oldest places on Earth is the Pilbara, a large region in the northwest of Australia. The local breed first began to form more than 3 billion years ago. The segments of its iron-rich stone serve as the best preserved example of the oldest rock in the world. Such ancient stones must be the source of some rather interesting fossils. And in general, many deserts can be suitable for research, where there is no tectonic activity and it is possible to find undisturbed rocks of the right age. Who knows, if you give the Silurian hypothesis the right to life, Perhaps research will go so far that with the right tests, researchers will one day be able to confidently say whether there was a person here or maybe a levitating humanoid with a big brain. That is, a certain civilization some millions of years ago. Questions about the planetary impact of civilization may, by the way, be important for the future exploration of other planets and our search for intelligent extraterrestrial life. Early Mars or early Venus may have been more habitable than they are now, and maybe one day we will find there the same geological deposits that indicate a civilization that once existed. And yes, it is hypothetically possible that previous civilizations of the Earth could have gone into space and left artifacts on other celestial bodies, such as the Moon or Mars. It will be easier to find obvious material evidence in these two worlds than on Earth, where erosion and tectonic activity have erased most of the cultural traces. But still, why look for alien life there, on other planets, when we could find it here, remote not for kilometers, but for years? Indeed, several unexplained temperature anomalies have been recorded in the history of the Earth, which could possibly accelerate the process of expulsion of intelligent life from the planet or its death. For example, it is believed that 55 million years ago there was a mysterious jump in temperature rise, known as the paleocentric thermal maximum. One of the most significant abrupt climate changes in geological history, lasting about 200,000 years. 
It manifested itself in a sharp increase in temperatures on the surface of continents and in the upper layers of the ocean, as well as in changes in the isotopic composition of atmospheric carbon and the extinction of a number of species. According to climate reconstructions, the temperature on the continents at that time increased by 8 degrees Celsius. The water temperature in the tropical zone was 20 degrees, which is one and a half degrees more than the current value. In the Arctic seas, the warming was significantly large scale, and the increase in the temperature of the surface waters of the Arctic Ocean could be up to 10 degrees Celsius. The most distinct thermal maximum was manifested in the carbon isotopic composition of carbonate deposits. During the thermal maximum, the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere reached at least five times higher than the current value. Moreover, his great honor dissolved in the ocean water, thereby increasing its acidity. As a result, the carbonate shells of the dying plankton began to dissolve in water. The thermal maximum could have been caused by the fall of an asteroid or comet, or it could have been the eruption of a huge volcano, or it could also have been caused by the activity of an ancient civilization that rose just like us and then fell. This, by the way, may be the fate of all advanced species, ups and downs that occur as naturally as the seasons change. Such a universe is ironic, constantly creating characters whose technology leads to the very end they are trying to avoid. So, the question is, Will we be able to notice and identify traces of the existence of an early civilization using the method of archaeology and paleontology today, and how can we do this? This question is still open. One of the key issues in assessing the probability of detecting such a civilization is understanding how often an industrially developed civilization appears, given that life originated and that some species is intelligent. There is little point in searching for buildings or long-lasting information carriers, since over millions of years tectonics and weathering will destroy them. Not to mention the relative rarity of such structures on Earth. Today, for example, massive clusters of solid buildings of human civilization occupy less than 1% of the land area. That is, in fact, if a huge asteroid in the near future changes the appearance of our planet beyond recognition, including people's faces, then you will have to spend a lot of time to find at least some evidence of life in the past. And most likely, rock art in the style of here I was is unlikely to help identify our civilization. But even if not now, it is quite possible that we will disappear in a few centuries or millennia, in fact in a moment on the scale of the geological history of the planet and even more so of the universe. And then human civilization is just a small episode, similar to those that already took place in earlier geological epochs. And then, in tens of millions of years, the next civilization will appear. Then again, perhaps some civilization will still be able to become something more. Or maybe we are the same civilization, and we have every chance to go further, exploring and getting to know ourselves, our planet and other measures. Admittedly, for lovers of travel and adventure, descending into the bowels of the earth may seem a very boring undertaking, because most of it consists of solid rock of grey, 
green and red colors, it depends on the predominant chemical element in it. There are no fantastic caves with dwarves inside the earth, nor giant worms that have not plunged into the depths of continents with abandoned cities. The ultra-high temperature and gigantic pressure will never allow the enchanting underground landscape created by the imagination of Jules Verne to appear. And yet, thanks to the latest technologies, the underground world can still impress us. Well, from the ocean depressions to the ancient deposits of the earth, we will dive into the depths of our planet and reveal the secrets of what lies beneath them, using the latest data on this subject. This time we are using a decent list of methods for studying the bowels of the earth, and here are some of them. Firstly, seismic exploration involves measuring vibrations caused by earthquakes or artificially created sources. Secondly, the graviometric survey measures the distribution of gravitational forces. Thirdly, drilling involves the extraction of samples from deep wells in the Earth's crust. Method 4. The polymagnetic method studies the orientation of magnetized crystals in rock layers. The fifth method is astronomical and space methods based on the study of meteorites. The sixth method allows reproducing geological processes in the form of modeling and studying them in laboratory conditions. And finally, the seventh method is a paleontological survey that studies ancient fossilized remains of animals, plants, and mollusks. An impressive list, isn't it? Therefore, we take all the equipment and hit the road. The easiest way to go deep into the bowels of the planet is to use an existing well. And there are many of them on Earth. But the deepest of them is the Kola Ultradeep Well, reaching a depth of 12,262 meters. For your information, hell has not been detected. True, although it is an impressive deep well, it is surprisingly negligible compared to the depth of the planet. After all, in total, it penetrates about a third of the thickness of the Earth's crust, and its length is only 0.2% of the total distance to the center of the Earth. What was eventually found in the Kola Ultradeep Well? To begin with, the researchers realized that they needed to update the temperature map for the bowels of the Earth, as they were faced with temperatures much higher than expected. At a depth of 5 kilometers more than 700 degrees Celsius. After another 2 kilometers, the temperature has already risen to 1200 degrees Celsius. At the 7 kilometer mark, one of the main discoveries was the boundary of the transition from granite to basalt. Another discovery was liquid water, which is much deeper than previously thought. One of the unexpected results was the appearance of open cracks filled with salt water, indicating that the Earth's crust is not dense, there are actually ways in it that allow liquids to flow. Even more exciting was the discovery of biological activity in rocks. At a depth of about 8 kilometers, the researchers extracted an underground layer of marine sediments. 24 species of ancient plankton, whose age exceeds 2 billion years, have been preserved in them. The shell of organic compounds preserved the microorganisms practically intact, despite the extreme values of pressure and temperature of the surrounding rock. These fossils have become one of the oldest evidences of life on Earth. Surprisingly, in fact, thousands of trillions of living organisms live in the bowels of the Earth, many of which are even unknown to science. The record depth with which the researchers took samples under the surface of the land was about 5 kilometers, under the surface of the ocean, 10 and a half kilometers. Moreover, up to 70% of all types of terrestrial microbes live underground. Among them there are several predominant ones that have been found under all continents. How these microbes spread through the bowels of the earth on all five continents is not yet clear. Perhaps they move inside the depths or penetrate from the surface through cracks in geological thresholds. 
The presented results indicate that even on our planet a huge mass of underground living organisms could exist without having noticeable manifestations on the surface. This means that there is not the slightest reason to exclude the existence of life on virtually any of the celestial bodies of the solar system, especially on the planets of the terrestrial group. Having considered the ancient Earth creatures and creatures, we continue the rapid drilling. We have a mantle in front of us. It is a thick layer of hot solid rock between the Earth's crust and the molten iron core and consists mainly of silicates, a wide range of compounds with a common structure of silicon and oxygen. Common silicates found in the mantle include garnet and peroxine. Another major type of rock found in the mantle is magnesium oxide. The temperature of the mantle varies greatly, from 1000 degrees Celsius at the boundary with the crust to 3700 degrees Celsius at the boundary with the core, so we are not destined to meet any plankton. Its viscosity also varies greatly. Basically, it is a solid rock, but at the boundaries of tectonic plates, mantle rocks are soft and able to move plastically for millions of years at great depth and under great pressure. The transfer of heat and material in the mantle helps shape the landscape of the Earth. Activity in the mantle drives plate tectonics, contributing to the formation of volcanoes and earthquakes. The mantle is divided into several layers, upper mantle, Transition zone, lower mantle and zone D are the area where the mantle meets the outer core. The upper mantle extends from the crust to a depth of about 410 kilometers. It is mostly solid, but its more malleable areas contribute to tectonic activity. The transition zone of the mantle is located at a depth of 410 kilometers to 660 kilometers below the Earth's surface, where rocks undergo radical transformations. Here they do not melt and do not disintegrate. Instead, their crystal structure undergoes important changes and rocks become much denser. Perhaps the most important aspect of the mantle transition zone is the abundance of water. Surprisingly, the crystals in the surface zone contain as much water as all the oceans on the surface of the Earth. Only here the water in the transition zone is not water in our understanding, it is not liquid and not steam. Instead, water exists in the form of hydroxide, hydrogen ion and oxygen with a negative charge, so it will not be possible to brew tea in it. By the way, the mantle has never been studied directly, but still many geologists study the mantle by analyzing xenoliths, which are a kind of rock enclosed inside another rock. The xenoliths that provide the most information about the mantle are diamonds. Yes, now I want to go underground a little more. In a good way, of course. Diamonds are formed in unique conditions. In the upper mantle at a depth of at least 150 kilometers below the surface. At greater depth and pressure, carbon crystallizes already in the form of graphite. And yet you may not have to dig deep. The fact is that sometimes diamonds rise to the surface during explosive volcanic eruptions, thereby forming diamond tubes through which you can wander for months, looking for a way out. With the help of them, we can look into the depth of up to 700 kilometers below the Earth's surface, into the lower mantle. Studies have shown that rocks in the deep mantle are most likely slabs of the seabed, which are about 3 billion years old. Meanwhile, we are getting to the core of the planet. The core of the Earth is a very hot and dense center of our planet. The spherical core is located at a depth of about 2,900 kilometers below the surface and has a radius of about 3,500 kilometers. The main sources of heat in the core are the decay of radioactive elements, the heat remaining after the formation of the planet, and the heat released when the liquid outer core solidifies near its boundary with the inner core. Precious metals such as gold, platinum, cobalt and other metals are also found in the core. This is very tempting, but remember that we are waiting for a very hot trip. 
Another key element in the Earth's core is sulfur. In fact, 90% of the sulfur on Earth is located in the core. Although we know that the core is the hottest part of our planet, its exact temperature is difficult to determine. Temperature fluctuations in the core depend on the pressure, the rotation of the Earth and the composition of the core elements. In general, the temperature ranges from about 4,400 degrees Celsius to 6,000 degrees Celsius. The inner core rotates differently than the rest of the planet. It rotates to the east, like the surface, but a little faster. It makes an additional revolution approximately every thousand years. As the entire Earth cools slowly, the inner core increases by about a millimeter each year. It grows because parts of the liquid outer core solidify or crystallize. The growth of the inner core occurs unevenly, and in parts, and it is affected by activity in the mantle. Growth is more concentrated around subduction zones, where tectonic plates slide from the lithosphere into the mantle thousands of kilometers above the core. The plates take heat from the core and cool the surrounding area, causing an increase in the number of cases of solidification. The crystallization process is very slow and constant radioactive decay in the bowels of the Earth slows it down even more. It is estimated that it will take about 91 billion years for the core to completely solidify. It is not surprising that many geologists describe the outer core as the geodynamo of the Earth. In order for a planet to have a geodynamo, it must rotate. There must be a liquid medium in its bowels, the liquid must be able to conduct electricity, and it must have an internal energy source that drives convection in the liquid. Variations in rotation, conductivity, and heat affect the geodynamo magnetic field. In fact, the Earth is the golden mean among the other planets of the solar system. It rotates steadily at a speed of 1,675 km per hour at the equator, thereby causing a convection current in a spiral. The liquid iron in the outer core is an excellent conductor of electricity and creates electric currents that drive the magnetic field. The energy that drives convection in the outer core comes as liquid iron droplets freeze on the solid inner core. During solidification, thermal energy is released. Warmer liquids rise up in a spiral, and colder solids descend under the influence of strong pressure. This is how convection occurs. Our journey has come to an end. I hope it was interesting. We take a couple of diamonds and return to the surface. Yes, our planet is unique for its natural wealth, diversity of flora and fauna, its vast oceans, continents and stable climate. Its bowels play an important role in the evolution of life on the planet. Knowledge of Earth sciences allows us to think globally and act locally. Find valuable resources such as water, metals, industrial minerals and energy, predict and prepare for natural disasters and study our own planet more than any other in the solar system.